the arthropoda ranging in size from microscopically small to bigger than the biggest person that you've probably ever met. Uh, very abundant. You can find them just about anywhere in the Arctic, from pole to pole, every continent, every ocean. Very rich. Uh, very rich in arthropods. And very rich in the fossil record, too. They've been around for a very, very long time. Uh, longer than the dinosaurs, before the first land plants. Uh, fungi, there were arthropods. Uh, and with all of this abundance, there's a lot of economic importance. Uh, a lot of negatives associated with arthropods in terms of parasites, uh, agents of disease, pests of uh, our uh, agriculture, of our pets and our homes and ourselves, uh, things like lice and fleas and cockroaches. Um, but a lot of positives as well. There are arthropods that we may eat, uh, especially crustaceans, uh, or we may rely upon their produce, things like honey, or their services. Uh, bees are responsible for pollinating most of our food crops. Uh, they can also uh, produce other natural products like waxes and silks, dyes. They can also be the sources of drugs. So, uh, a very large phylum, a lot for us to learn about them because they are important to us. So how do you know something is an arthropod when you look at it? Knowing that they are so diverse. There are some things that we can say uh, characterize arthropods and things that we can apply to every single member of the arthropoda. Uh, well, we can say that they are protostome mates, so they all uh, have uh, true organ systems, tissue systems. Um, they are metameric, meaning they are arranged in parts. They have tagmosis, a body arrangement. Uh, the parts of the body are called tagmata, or just one tagma. The appendages that they have are jointed. This is what arthropod means, is jointed uh, legs or jointed parts. Uh, they have an exoskeleton, which is kind of like the cuticle of other members of the Ecdysozoa, but um, the exoskeleton is more complex than the typical cuticle, much, can be much hardened uh, relative to the cuticle, which is more pliable in uh, nematodes, for example. Uh, the exoskeleton is made up of Proteins, lipids, uh, chitin, which is a type of polysaccharide. It can even have calcium carbonate embedded in there to give extra toughness. And it's produced by the epidermis. So a layer of cells underneath the exoskeleton as part of what would be the skin for you and I um, is what makes up the exoskeleton of arthropods. Uh, and because they molt, uh, the technical term for molting is ecdysis. Ecdysis, it means molting. Uh, and what is left behind is called an exuvium. An exuvium is, and many of y'all who have grown up here in the South uh, may have found... Uh, the exuvi of insects, especially things like cicadas, um, in the summertime, you, you find something that looks like a cicada, which what you find is just the, the, the hull or the husk of a cicada. That's the exuvium is the technical term for that. And that's what enables them to grow and change is that they can uh, release or let, uh, get rid of that uh, outer exoskeleton and produce a newer one inside. Starts out soft and pliable and then hardens in air or can harden in water for aquatic ones. So another thing that we find with arthropods is that they have uh, complex muscles, smooth and striated muscles. 
um, that are attached to the insides of the exoskeleton as opposed to the outside. They have a circulatory system that is open. So they do have a heart. They do have arteries, but these arteries pump the hemolymph into this cavity called the hemocele. Uh, as far as the nervous system goes, the nervous system is a bit more complicated than a lot of other uh, invertebrates, with the exception of things like uh, cephalopods and the mollusca. Uh, they have antennae that are a lot of that are rich in sensory organs, chemosensory and and uh, tactosensory. Uh, they have some of the most complex eyes, apart from. Uh, cephalopods and vertebrates. Uh, they also have simple eyes called ocelli, or just one is an ocellus, that can uh, sense light and dark patches. They're not really image forming. Uh, they can respire. Uh, they have a respiratory system. They can either respire through their, their skin, through the exoskeleton, or through gills, book gills, book lungs, or tracheae. Many different ways for them to breathe. Uh, they have males and females. They are dioecious, and they typically have internal fertilization, so they don't just release their gametes uh, out into the environment and then fertilize them out in the environment. They actually have uh, internal fertilization. However, they lay eggs, most of them. Uh, or they have eggs that are produced inside the body, which may be fertilized, the eggs may hatch inside uh, the, the mother, and so it may look like they're producing live young, but they're actually just eggs hatching inside the mother. We call that ovovivipary. And in some, especially in insects that we're familiar with, they go through a metamorphosis, which is a dramatic change in body plan. Our first subphylum is the only extinct subphylum we're going to talk about this semester. So all trilobites are extinct. They've been extinct for a very long time, since the uh, Permian extinction, which ended the Paleozoic era and paved the way for the Mesozoic era, uh, which is when the dinosaurs uh, roamed the Earth. So these were extinct before the dinosaurs. Uh, their tagmosis is they had a head and a thorax and an abdomen. And the, they get their name from their um, abdomen having three lobes. So tri-lobe. So the two sides and the one in the middle. And their appendages were branched. We only see that in one extant or still living phylum. All right, so uh, a couple of subphyla. We've got the chelicerata. These are organisms that have their mouth parts uh, that are somewhat pincer-like. So chelate means pincer-like. So a uh, classic example of what that means, think about something like a, like a scorpion. It has those pincers. Those pincers you might think of as being like arms, but really they're mouth parts. But these chelate uh, chelicerae, they can be modified into fangs, or they can be needle-like, or they can be uh, adapted for uh, being uh, for hunting. So they have these chelicerae, then they have pedipalps, which are the second pair of appendages around the mouth, and then they have four pairs of legs, okay? They do not have antennae. None of them have antennae. Uh, and for the chelicerata, the tagmosis is they have two body regions. Uh, some folks, we used to call it a cephalothorax and an abdomen, but more appropriately, we should call it a prosoma and an epistosoma. So before body and an after body. Is what prosoma and epistosoma mean. First class within the subphylum Chelicerata are the Meristomata. 
These are things like horseshoe crabs. Well, that's what they are. They're horseshoe crabs. And you often hear them referred to as living fossils uh, because we find not a whole lot of change in the body plan of horseshoe crabs for over 200 million years. Now, remember, that's a very long time. That's like since before the dinosaurs began to roam the Earth. Uh, they have simple ocelli, and they also have compound eyes, and they breathe by book gills. So they keep these book gills wet, and they can see the reason they're called book gills is they kind of look like the, the leaves of a book. Uh, their chelicerae, or their mouth parts, are pincer-like, and many of their legs are also pincer-like as well. And a lot of people are scared of horseshoe crabs because they have this, this pointy tail that looks like a, it's gonna, they're going to come at you and poke you with it. Uh, but that's not really what that telson, or that tail, is there for. That telson is there to help them. Uh, these are littoral animals, or they live in uh, the ocean, but in typically in shallow areas. And when you live in shallow areas of the ocean, it means there's going to be a lot of waves coming along, and those waves can very easily flip you over or knock you down. And when that happens, that telson can be used to right yourself to flip yourself back over so that's what they really use it for not so much for defense uh, as for just helping them to balance and to, to regain their their uh, correct orientation so they can move around the pycnogonida are sea spiders uh, so they're all marine you're not going to find them unless you look really hard for them uh, but they have eight legs, which is why they look spider-like, even though they are not directly related to spiders. They are not spiders in the sense that they're not arachnids in the uh, order Aranae. Uh, but they have uh, very reduced bodies. So you can see that here's the, the, here's the head, uh, and here's the abdomen, or the cephalothorax, and the abdomen... Um, but these parts are very reduced so they have to cram their organs into their legs and here this is an example of these are ovagers here which are where the males carry the eggs rather than uh, the females carrying the fertilized eggs and they have sucking mouth parts that their chelicerae are modified into uh, a sucking proboscis. This brings us to a very large class of arthropods, not the largest by a long stretch, but a large one, the arachnida, and very diverse. Arachnids include spiders, scorpions, mites, ticks, vinegaroons, tailless whip scorpions, daddy long legs, which are not spiders, and pseudoscorpions and many, many others. Uh, most of the arachnids are predators, but there are also some parasites and some detritivores or organisms that eat on, feed on dead things. Uh, some have venom. Uh, they have 